and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are part of the multi-headed monster that is OSS, also known as One Small Step currently developing the RPG Zone 17, which we'll be getting into. How are you two doing today, man? I'm doing great, thanks. And I am doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, one of the traditions around here is the humble beginnings, or the origin story, if you will. So with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction, respectively, to role-playing games, and what made it stick? Uh, Mike, you want to begin? Sure. Um, so my name is Mike Anderson. Uh, I own uh, One Small Step, uh, formerly um, some other uh, companies uh, that uh, are, are game publishers. What got me involved in all of this starts back, I'm going to say 1980, for crying out loud. I had some uh, high school buddies uh, drag me out and uh, put a gun to my head and make me play uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons um, and uh, some other war games of the time, squad leader and whatnot. Um, what made role playing stick for me, I think, was uh, uh, having a, a gaming system that for the first time uh, really, really had a high fog of war. That when you when you encountered something, uh, you didn't know what it could do until you you met up with it once, and uh, you didn't know it was going to be around the next corner. With most games uh, of the time, there tends to be no no fog of war. Take a game like chess or checkers; you can see all the pieces, you can see what all the available moves are. Um, so having something new took the the strategic interest of the product and just elevated it to eleven. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my first experiences with uh, role-playing games was in high school. This would have been back in around uh, 2014. And it was a uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition game that I was playing with my friends. And I just kind of got... I essentially, essentially, I got hooked on the creative aspects. I really enjoy building worlds. I really enjoy creating characters and so yeah i began with dungeons and dragons and then i got really got into call of cthulhu it's still one of my favorite game systems and from there i kind of just started drifting towards a career in game development mm -hmm. um mike i i did note on i did note on the site that you had listed Starfleet Battles as your embarrassing favorite, which I can understand why that would be listed as such. Any game with a 500-page rulebook is a game that you shouldn't easily admit to uh, uh, enjoying in, in polite company. <laughs> I can hear the hero. I can hear the fans of Hero Systems screaming in the distance. Uh, that is, yeah, that that is also true. The um, I'm trying to remember uh, uh, what all those titles were. We mostly played the uh, uh, the modern and science fiction version, but yeah, they had uh, a lot of different products there. Um, the I will I will admit that I, that Starfleet Battles is, is one is one I pick on because when it comes to that um, hyper fixation uh, hyper fixation on simulationism that was a I would say a plague in the 80s, and to a lesser extent the to a lesser extent the 90s, but it was still there. Oh yeah, like uh, if you crack open any of those uh, old RPGs, which I mean, I I have a soft spot for them, but good lord, they are just dense. Like even second edition D and D, you. You go through the rules for combat, and there's there's a bunch of stuff in there that 
it's it's really good that it kind of got left out of later editions. Like the massive tables of pole arms, that's always gets beaten up on. Uh weapon the, speed. Have Yep, weapon speed. Good lord. Uh what else? Oh yeah, uh ro uh I think con uh, I think the combat system is has something weird with initiative, like you're re-rolling it every uh time uh it turns around. Oh. I will I will note that I know a lot of people pick on Thaco. I look at Thaco as something that was an all right, it was an all right idea that was explained poorly. Cuz yeah, I can run say um Adventure Conqueror King system or Hyperborea or whatnot, which have Thaco, but they're better. Ex but it's better explained there, mostly because it's not called. Mostly because it's not called that. Um, it's usually it's usually just it's usually just called two hit. Um, but whenever it comes to complexity with a, with a lot of those games, Fantasy Games Unlimited's um, body of work is my whipping boy, uh, and. I have had the misfortune of trying to play, but never finish. I don't know anybody who's actually finished it. The campaign for North Africa. Uh -huh. it, isn't that the one that has the rules for uh, water evaporating from your canteen? It's, it's fuel evaporation and spillage, yes. There's a rule for that. <laughs> <laughs> The campaign game is estimated to take 1600 hours to play. Uh, we never finished it because any, because any because any game that I was in where it was ever played eventually the fight started. Yeah. I I, mean... I want to put this out there the, the the single best use for AI like a chat GPT sort of application in my opinion in 2024 is to set up two of them to go play the campaign for North Africa so that humans don't have to. <laughs> well, I do I do know that peop that people made um people made computer ports of the game probably to help speed up the process years ago. Well, you know, I I, I think that uh Eyesight Starfleet Battles is my embarrassing favorite. A uh, couple of reasons there. The, the, the way I got into that game, if, it, if someone had handed me the 500-page rulebook, I would have never played it. But it started off in a single box from from uh, 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 Amarillo Design Bureau slash Task Force Games. And the rulebook was maybe 32 pages. And it was all about Star Trek. Again, if it had been about any other IP, um, it wouldn't have been interesting. But uh, at the time, Star Trek was a big deal. And... Uh, uh, 32 page rule book. You can move your Federation Navy cruiser around and blow Klingons up. And that was just a really cool thing. And then every six months, there was a little expansion book. And that went on for a while. And then there were captain's logs. And then there were uh, uh, extra, you know, mission packs and whatnot. And over time, they aggregated that rule book. And now it sits in a three ring binder in my, in my closet, unloved. Which is uh, unfortunate. I would wouldn't mind dragging it out from time to time. But all of that said, one of the best features of that game is it taught me how to abstract. And what I mean by that is it showed me all the ways you shouldn't design something. And I've moved on. I, in addition to to owning one small step, that's my avocation. My primary vocation is I design games for the government and uh, simulations and whatnot. And abstraction is the key. We don't, uh, if we were doing some engineering level simulation where you're trying to do measures of performance on an object, for example, you might build a mathematical model that will determine whether or not some new missile will, will reach Mach 3, you know, in so many seconds. That's a measure of performance. Mm -hmm. Does the thing do what you want it to do in three dimensional space? Uh, the next higher level of, of, uh, modeling at government level is uh, uh, from engineering, you go to engagement level. And now you're not testing one missile on one launch pad. You're now testing, let's say, two airplanes against two other airplanes, and you're in, you know, having an engagement. Now what you're trying to find out is, does that missile that, that you've determined goes Mach 3, does that actually change the combat in, uh, to, to give, you, give you some advantage? Um, 
the next level above that is mission level. And when you, once, by the time you get to mission level, you're starting to abstract things. An individual item on the board is no longer a single airplane or a single uh, tank. It's now a battalion or a uh, you know a squadron or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And you're not measuring uh, individual missile hits. You're measuring effect using some sort of you know Lancastrian. Uh, 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 attrition model or something along those lines to take take what you're actually displaying on screen away from the atomic level uh, uh, you know screws that you're that you'd be twisting at one of these lower levels. So if I were to design Starfleet battles today, I would choose a different approach. And if I were to design a role playing game today, which I've done, um, I wanted to take a different approach. I wanted to take all the things I've learned from Dungeons and Dragons and Hero System and Rune Quest and uh, uh, Rune and, and and other role playing games. Take the stuff that I really enjoy, percolate out most of the rest, um, and uh, make any improvements that I can I can squeeze in there. It's quite possible that no one on the face of the earth, other than my playtesters, will enjoy the product. Conceivable, unlikely. But uh, I'm going to be releasing this uh, here in October as a uh, as an object to art of this is the refinement of all the things I've learned in the last 30 years of, of gaming mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with the hope that I've learned the, the right lessons and that I've implemented uh, those lessons well in this design. So uh, we've really tried to trim out uh, the complexity and the atomic level um, recreation of reality in favor of something that is much more cinematic, plays much faster. Uh, and I guess history will be a judge of that, future history. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a trend among a lot of game designers to have to have this sim to have this simplicity good, complexity bad, but I've always argued that it is a pendulum. And you can swing too far one way on the on the complexity end, and you can swing too far the other way on the simplicity end. Oh sure. Um, th as with everything, there's 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 a bar curve, you know, a, a bar curve to to uh, uh, standard distribution to you know take a look at uh, to uh, evaluate. I guess you know how far you're going. Whether it's uh, you know if if you if you're if you're too interested in going in one direction, complexity wise, you're right. You're you're uh, rolling dice to to verify the spin of individual particles. Uh, and if you go too far to the left, you simply boil everything down to what's called life stat, where you have one number and you just roll against that one number when you try to do anything. Um, and uh, both ends are, I don't know, I guess anytime you're at the at either end of a, a bell curve, um, you know you, you've entered the world of fanaticism, I think, and you've moved too far. So I hope we've we've struck the right you know balance. Um, I hope to walk you through a little bit of it today, and then yeah. you can uh, draw your own conclusions. Now, I think the f the first thing to note is this uh, is the is are you f you're probably familiar with uh, with the concept of appendix N. Oh, of course I am. Why don't Why don't you share with us so that so that Robert knows? Yeah, yeah. That's... Now, in old school D and D, Appendix N was a section in the in the core materials that covered inspirational media that ranged from books to film to to um. Oh, a, a lot of it was not was non tabletop stuff within that inspirational media. Yeah. Um. Other ga other games have you have used that have used that concept for the think the things that served as inspiration or can, or can help or can help establish the for lack of a better term look of a particular game appendix n is just uses the shorthand for all of this so with that in mind what is zone 17 what would be some of the things that are in zone 17's appendix n in your in your guys's opinion uh mike you want to field this Sure. Um, the original, well, oh boy, where we go. There was an anime, wasn't a particularly great one, uh, 
many, many, many years ago called Area 88. And in Area 88, all of the characters were mercenaries in some sort of Middle Eastern foreign legion. And they would, one guy, I guess, uh, one, of the, one of the characters is running away from a mob boss that he owes him money and uh, try not to get his knuckles uh, busted. So he uh, gets on a plane, signs up and changes his identity. Um, other people show up with, with other reasons, girlfriend left me, whatever. Same kind of uh, drama that, that, that powers uh, fictions around the French Foreign Legion sort of thing. And so you're a paid mercenary, uh, you scare up your own fighter plane and you pay for all your bullets and your fuel and your repairs uh, out of your out of your bounties, and you fly around on missions in an effort to uh, collect bounties uh, and salvage uh, to to uh, eventually buy your way out of your contract. Anything that happens to you after you've any anything that you've earned after you buy out your contract is yours to keep. And so the original plan of the game was a miniatures only game with enough role playing to support the drama that I've described and uh, replacing all the airplanes with, with mecha and uh, late model tanks. Um, and we realized that the role-playing aspect, the role-playing possibilities were really strong. And we realized also that uh, putting together uh, a, a more feature-rich role-playing game, uh, broader background, broader world, that, that sort of thing, would give us a lot more opportunities for interesting uh, uh, combats if that's all you're interested in. And if you're interested in the role-playing aspect, then uh, you know the big mecha combat may not be your thing. There's so many other animes to choose from. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a game with two scales. One scale is agent scale, which is typical scale for everything from, you know, it's, it's a 72 to one, uh, uh, basically one inch equals about two meters or six feet. Um, characters are represented on the board by miniatures that are about 28 inches to 30 inches tall. Um, and uh, uh, anytime you want to represent Die Hard or uh, True Lies or John Wick kind of action, there you go. Any kind of old kung fu movie uh, that you you know enjoyed as a you know, growing up, uh, you can do all of that at agent scale. Agent scale, on the other hand, is too small, too tight to represent uh, mecha and tanks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a tank on a board like that would be the size of a shoebox. And so there's a battle scale, and battle scale relates to um, agent scale at about three to one. So at this point, it's six meters per inch, and a tank is only, well, it's an armored fighting vehicle of any kind. It's only about an inch or two too long. Now, you can get into smaller vehicles uh, that maybe only, you know, seat two. Uh, in fact, if you want to do um, uh, Fast and Furious kind of car races, I suppose you could. We, we've done a couple of those things just to verify that racing cars around a track would actually work. But that's not really what the system is ideally designed for. It's not a car racing game. Uh, what it's designed for is to represent the differences between tanks and mecha and why you might use one over the other uh, in a way that other games don't. So it came in as a miniatures game. The role-playing aspect was expanded. And now I treat it more as a role-playing game with a really powerful miniatures kind of side saddle at both agent scale and battle scale. Mm -hmm. Now, and, um, oh, go ahead. Can I bring it around it back to section N? Yeah, um, appendix N. Yeah. But go on, but go on. Sorry. Um, yeah, other inspirations, of course, uh, John Wick and Die Hard, uh, 80s action movies in general. Uh, and the I'd say the Mad Max series and Fallout uh, include uh, has a bit, you know a bit of inspiration there, especially mm -hmm. with the uh, scav character role. Yeah, and with that with that in mind, since Mecha was brought up, um, that brings that brings in another conundrum because Mecha can take can take quite can take quite a few forms. You can have the you can have the jumped up power armor or or 
or the like. Um, if this is where this is where you get into things like like Gundams or Ma or Macross, or you could have the ta the tanks with legs, um, a la BattleTech, Heavy Gear, or some of Macross again. <laughs> um, when it comes to the mecha scale, um, with the what sort what sort of mecha do you envision with Zone Seventeen? Are we dealing with tanks with legs, or are we dealing with something more mobile? Um, the quick answer is the latter. Uh, the idea is that with modern systems, the missiles will become increasingly cheap and increasingly uh, intelligent. And so, uh, and ditto with fire control systems, driving cannons, uh, the prevalence of battlefield lasers. The idea that you're going to shoot a missile at a target and that missile is going to high have a have a high altitude uh, or a high flight profile is silly because you'll see it 100 miles away and shoot it down. So that, that missile never gets to you. So all of your missiles have to fly low. Well, okay, so you'll see them at 20 miles away and you'll shoot them down. Um, so what things can actually engage the these tanks of the future? Oh, one of the things we probably should have shared. Um, the game takes place on or around 2080. So it's 60 years in the future. So all of the technological developments that are possible uh, you know, we try to we try to uh, include those that are reasonable and dramatically appropriate. Uh, so in this case, I think that uh, the the disadvantage that the a, a big heavily armed tank has in a battlefield like that is it can't get out of the way. If you shoot a projectile at it, it stands there and tries to withstand it because it has thick armor. Uh, the mecha that we're describing would be more of a Veritech fighter and less of a you know, ironmonger kind of uh, design. And uh, the, the tanks with legs is definitely a thing that you can use our mecha design uh, tool to build. But I think you're going to find that it is an expensive thing that just dies. That it doesn't have the heavy armor of an actual track vehicle. And it doesn't have anywhere near the mobility of a human analog. Uh, to give you some idea of how we use human analogs, if your mecha uh, is... Uh, let's say 40 feet tall or 13 or so meters, 12 or so meters for people who use an intelligent measurement system. Um, and it, it will look and act and behave like a human. And you can actually do melee combat with it and you use uh, Gung Fu as the skill to drive that mecha around, you use parkour to make it run down the road and turn around. Whereas with any of these other vehicles, you'd, you'd use some flavor of piloting. But with the with the mecha, it is a human analog. It lets you know when you know something's going to hit you. It helps you move out of the way so that it doesn't hit you. That you're you're going to be able to make quick and amazing evasions and dodges to avoid fire more so than try to stand around and withstand it. Mm -hmm. Now, that, um, that's good. That's a good thing to nail down because. I've I've seen my fair share of experiences where people talk about making a mech themed RPG in, or campaign, and I'm like, mecha is a is a subgenre in, into itself with a whole lot of variants. So you need to nail down what of what of those variants you're leaning towards, because it's not it's not exactly something you can do kitchen sink. Uh, you're not you're not gonna ha you're not going to have um. You're not, going, you're not going to have gu um, Gundams in this in unless you're dealing with something ridiculous on purpose like Super Robot. You're not going to have um, the slower, tanky types of mechs in the same conversation as the more um, power armor like gu um, Gundams. One of them is going to clearly get wiped out in that kind of situation. Well, among the things that will come into play is uh, it'll it'll to some extent it will come down to technology in that mm -hmm. uh, some nations and organizations don't have the tech to field uh, some of the more amazing, you know, techs that the Japanese and the, and the United States will field smarter, quicker, sneakier uh, uh, technology than uh, some of the other uh, players in the field. Uh, without getting into any politics, uh, part of the game does expect that there is a, a functional Russian military 80 years in the future, whatever field, you know, whatever, whatever uh, that has to, uh, whatever has to happen to make that come into play. So we can have 
slower, clunkier, heavily armored uh, uh, things that feel, you know, feel design strong kind of uh, uh, kind of attitude. Um, and then the Europeans will use some high tech and and uh, you know some more practical kinds of applications. Uh, a, a mecha might cost you $100 million. A tank might cost you $10 million. So can 10 tanks defeat a mecha? Eh, maybe. Um, so you know, in terms of wiped out, I would agree with you in terms of one-to-one -one, that the, uh, the, the, the strong mecha might not do well against the, 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 the mecha that can dance. But I think where you'll see the difference is the strong mecha might be a lot cheaper, and that might be enough to allow you to buy, uh, you know, when you build your army, you might come in with three very high tech large units, and I might come up with forty small ones that are that are low tech. And your ability to pop my uh, cheaper ones uh, with individual shots might be true, but can you get all of us before we surround you and get you? Yeah. And that'll be up to whether or not your design strategy well conforms with your uh, execution strategy. Well, no. No plan survives the first encounter. Now, with that, now continuing on from that, um, as I as I understand it, you you guys have de you guys have developed a um, a particular a particular system, the fe what you're calling the feedback system, and a lot of games will have will have kind of a roam when it comes to the, when it comes to their core mechanic. As opposed to say the days of AD and D, where you had a bunch of sub, where you had a bunch of um, sub mechanics for a bunch of different things. Hence, hence the phrase "all roads lead to Rome." Applying here. So, with that in mind, with the feedback system, what is the core mechanic when it comes to die re when it comes to die resolution? One of my favorite uh, role playing systems of ancient days was West End's uh, Greg Gostickian design for um, Star Wars role-playing. Yeah, so, yeah, the D6 character... system. I'm sorry? The D6 system. That is correct. Some of the later systems I've played, I don't like them as much. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but in that system, uh, you had about six skills, and each skill had a handful of dice. It might be as few as two. It might, at least when your character was new, it might be as many as four. And then as you uh, refine your character going forward, you would be able to spend experience points to boost up dice until such time as you might be rolling eight or nine dice. Uh, and one of the challenges I had with that game is that at 8, 11 o'clock at night on a Friday, uh, after a couple of beers, your ability to, to add up the totals on, on nine dice was more effort than you wanted to put in. And so one of the things we did with that is you might still get to roll nine dice in this game. You've you got seven skills, six of them uh, you use to roll dice, and you're going to choose one skill, you're going to roll the dice for that skill, and then you're going to apply those die results to functions of that skill, and you've got the ability to, to share some of those unused dice with other skills. There's some rules about uh, uh, how much you can share. Um, but the idea is you're going to roll a handful of dice. Uh, you never have to do more than pair dice. Like you never total up three dice. You to you just use one die result or a pair of dice. Mm. And so the your outcome results are two to twelve, and they make a little bit less of a bell curve, more of a tent, you know, curve. But the same kind of function, so that the results will tend to be towards the middle. You see what all your results are. And then you apply those results to buy effects. And you generally know what the cost of effects are. For example, the rule book will tell you what difficulty number you need to overcome to jump from one roof to the adjacent roof. So you don't have to tax uh, the, the referee for that kind of thing. Okay, um, And you don't have to total up large numbers of dice. But higher level characters get to roll a large number of dice, so they get to do a lot of things during a turn. Uh, using uh, going back to the fact that we use John Wick as an earlier example, uh, our hero in in that film can uh, cope with uh, two or even three uh, thugs in, in in the course of one turn, which in in our game is represented by about six to ten seconds. 
Okay. Um, so in the movie, in six to se 10 seconds, if he can defeat three bodyguards, then we need our game to have a character of that level be able to defeat three bodyguards in about one turn. So that there need to be enough dice that hit the table that you can throw a die at a bodyguard, the bodyguard dodges that die, and then you throw two dice at the bodyguard, which puts a wound on him so severe that he just falls over bleeding out. And you need to be able to do that two or three times a turn and hope that you don't get overwhelmed, hope that you don't run out of bullets, hope that you don't get surrounded, and you avoid hoping by using strategy in terms of your play to maneuver around the board to prevent getting surrounded, to prevent having to cope with too many people. Sometimes you withdraw, sometimes you move to cover rather than dodge and, and whatnot. So you apply the dice and you apply the strategy uh, and you, uh, those two things work together and a really good player with a, a fair number of dice can handle themselves quite well and make for very amazing cinematic action that plays out very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, what I, what I do, based on what you mentioned about it, about it, um, use, using dice, is it, would it be fair of me to say that this is going to be a situation where you're going to be, where you're going to be rolling dice exclusive, exclusively, there's not going to be dice plus static modifiers. So we don't use modifiers per se. There are there are rare exceptions where we use modifiers. For the most part, uh, what we do when, when you're rolling dice is your character has training in various. Uh, skills of, of choice. There are 36 skills in the game, and you choose which ones you, you're trained in and which ones you're a, a where you specialize. Now, you can't afford very many specializations. You can't even afford a whole bunch of, of, of training. But uh, if, if your character was a tech specialist and mine was a tech specialist, I might know everything there is to know about engineering and demolition, while you might know everything there is to know about security systems and hacking. So... You know, that's how we would be different, even though on on the surface, we'd pretty you know, look very similar. Um, so uh, hit me with your question again, because I I lost. Um, even as even as you advance, is it a case where you're just going to be getting more di more die or 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 um, static modifiers going to be involved at any point? I remember where I was trying to go. I, I, I apologize. So when you have the training and the specialization, those don't add pluses or, or whatever. Uh, what you're what you're getting out of it is um, any skill for which you are not trained, you don't have a checkbox in it, the highest roll result that you can use is a four. So you might have rolled a six. You might want to apply the six. But when you apply the six to that function, because you've got no formal training, it only is only going to count as a four. So in effect, you you could roll on that skill. Each of the dice you apply would be rolled a one, a two, a three, a four, a four, and a four. Those would be the, the possible results. If you're a specialist, you don't really make very many mistakes. And so that's called, I'm, I'm sorry, those are, I, I, I misspoke. In the first case, it's called a cap. You'd be capped at a four. In the second case, you've got specialization, you'd have a floor and on all the things you're specialized in, your floor is a three. So if you roll a die and apply it to something you specialize in, the lowest possible result would be a three, and you could the, all the results on the die would be three, 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 four, five, six. Um, some things that you do, for example, if you're firing an automatic weapon, you would earn re-rolls. So that's an opportunity for you to take uh, mediocre die results and re-roll them to see if you, if you don't get a better one. Um, firing an automatic weapon do doesn't make you automatically hit the target, but by putting more lead down range, basically, it improves your chances. So it get, essentially, it gives you an, a, you know one, two, or even three additional opportunities that uh, some portion of your fire will uh, make contact with the with the target. Um, so those are the things that that we uh, try to use instead of a stack of modifiers. I will say this though: we have combined. Uh, the, the one case that will be really prevalent and will be used all the time where there actually is a modifier, and that is on what people in other systems would call damage. At agent scale, we don't use damage, we use trauma. 
that you're normally trying to inflict trauma on a target and your target has an evade rating. If the target's behind a tree, the evade rating's probably around an eight. If the target is um, uh, running really fast, that evade rating will be dependent upon how fast and, and maneuverable that target is. Let's say somewhere between like a six and a 10. It depends on, you know, uh, the, the, the target itself is going to roll dice and apply those die results and move around corners and do the things. And each of those uh, has, a, has an obvious effect. For example, if you're moving seven inches on the turn, that raises your evade rating to seven. If you're moving 12 inches, it increases your evade rating to 12. It's pretty easy stuff. So once you've, you know, oh, I've rolled 12, I'm gonna move 12 inches and I'm, I'm, my evade rating is now 12. It's hard to hit me because I'm moving so fast and I'm gonna fire my weapon at you. I'm gonna need to come up with that evade rating or higher for my weapon to, to uh, release its projectiles or whatever that hits you. Easy enough. If you rolled a seven to evade and I've rolled a 10 to hit you, I not only make contact with you, but I, my attack roll exceeded your, your evade roll by three. So that three is the base amount of trauma I'm going to do. And then to that, I add the, the trauma bonus of the weapon. So a normal nine millimeter handgun is plus three. I would deliver six trauma to you. And uh, we don't we don't have, like, have, like have a second die roll for for determining damage. The the to hit roll di already did all of that. To, you know, it's not like you're going to save hours uh, of game time with that particular economy. But that's one of the ways that we economize, so you don't need additional die rolls. And that mm -hmm. really good hits always automatically boost the boost the effect. Yeah. Now, when it comes to character creation, are you guys doing freeform, or are you or are you building around archetypes? You want to talk about roles, Robert? Uh, uh sure. So, um, actually, um, you know what? You should cover this. I'm. I'll be honest. I'm not a great interviewee. <laughs> well, okay, fair enough. Um. So the original version of the game had one character type. Essentially, you were a soldier, a mercenary, a legionnaire, and you were going to pilot vehicles, air, you know, aircraft, mecha, in, in a period 60 years in the future. Um, and uh, as we found more richness in the role playing, we added additional roles and made the first book all about being a character as opposed to all of the vehicle combat. So the, the four archetypes that are in the game are suit, soldier, solo, and scav. Mm -hmm. So a suit is just your typical corpo agent, um, somebody who works for Megacorp uh, in Zone 17, uh, the, uh, a, a former superpower has essentially collapsed and in, in, its, in its place has risen about a dozen megacities. And those megacities are managed by uh, enormous conglomerate uh, megacorps, as one might be familiar with from a dozen other varieties of fiction. And uh, you start off in one particular uh, uh, city in that zone. Um, and uh, if you're going to be a suit, then you work for uh, one of the companies in, in that, and you do troubleshooting for them. It might mean that you do some kind of detective work. It might mean you're doing corporate espionage uh, that's a conversation for the players and the referee, who in this game is called the controller. So the, the players and the controller will have a, a um, game session zero mm -hmm. where they'll discuss what they want to do, or the referee will discuss what uh, the referee is going to play, uh, you know, present for folks, and they move forward from there. So that's a that's a typical suit. The soldier works in kind of the same way. Remember, these city states are run by megacorps and the megacorp need security forces. So uh, soldiers would be anything from uh, working on, let's say like a SWAT team or um, special operations forces, uh, heavy hitters like Marines and army with big mecha um, and uh, um, secret service. You know, basically where you've got the, uh, the technology uh, and, the, and the hardware to, to uh, cope with everything from 
a, a lone gunman to the Yakuza to an enemy city state that has decided that you've got something that they want and you're not willing to negotiate on terms they find, you know, mm -hmm. uh, satisfactory. So the third group is of Polo and they're also called runners. And these are the people who do all the gig work. They don't technically work for a cor corporation. They don't technically, uh, they're, they're, but they're, they're part of the city. They're part of the cityscape. Um, they'll Freelancers. Typically work... I'm sorry. Freelancers. They're freelancers. Yeah. And, uh, the one of the advantages of being a solo is that if you're a corpo agent or you know, being the, the suit or the soldier, uh, you owe a debt of like two hundred thousand uh, dollars to your to your uh, benefactor that they've hooked you up with this cool job and you get to do the cool stuff and play with the cool toys, but you owe the money and you've got to buy your way out of your contract before you can start making some real money. Where at you know where you reach a state where everything that you salvage is yours as opposed to simply something to be pawned off to pay off your debtors um so the solo doesn't have that the downside is the solo doesn't have access to any of the corpo um uh, assets and uh it's not that the corporation is going to give a soldier or a suit anything for free, but there's a, a substantial diff discount if you're on the team. Um, so uh, um, I will butt in to say that solos do have a debt, but it's uh, pretty low. I think it's only a thousand credits for suits and soldiers have 10,000 credits in debt. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a wild difference. So yep. uh, on the other hand, and, luck. if you want to rent a tank, you, you just can't when you're a solo. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so the, the fourth group is, is are the scabs. These are people who live outside the cities. Now in our in our zone 17, it's assumed that climate change and and uh, warfare uh, and uh, other uh, demographic collapse, there's all kinds of effects that have come into come into play. And uh, being in the city, the, the cities essentially have walled themselves off and in between the cities, you generally have some variety of wasteland. It might not always be desert, but whatever it is, it'll be relatively inhospitable. If you go outside, you're going to be armored. You're going to you're going to have an environment suit, and uh, you 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 do so to either drive goods to to port or to a buyer or something along those lines to to move uh, uh, move some precious cargo from one point to another. Um, and uh, the scavengers are people who live outside. Of that environment they occupy abandoned cities ruins and whatnot they're not always evil they're not always bandits sometimes they form up into cool communities and uh, and do that sort of thing but these are the folks that have no debt but they also don't have access to a walmart so uh if you want a fallout-esque kind of environment where you're wandering around in the wasteland and uh trying to uh, uh piece things together that's a, a perfect um, a perfect role to choose to to play out that kind of adventure. Mm -hmm. So, with that now, with that in mind, give, given that you're going with you're going with archetypes, um, is it a is it a case where a character creation is go, is going to be point based, or do you have a different approach? Since an issue that can happen with with full point based or full free form is analysis paralysis. You guys have probably seen this in the past. I don't worry too much, and maybe this is just my own internal biases. I don't worry too much about folks being paralyzed in terms of their character design. I do have some concern that when it comes to actually acting on the board. Uh, there will be some folks will, who may have difficult time figuring out what the best thing for them to do in a given circumstance is. Uh, so that's something we can talk about in a few minutes if, if you care to. Mm -hmm. um, it is a point-based system. I mean, you begin with 25 points to start buying up your dice, and every mission you'll collect one to three additional points. The points are called chimps, and the chimps are just character improvement points. Just a, mm -hmm. just a silly acronym, and you know, chimp is a cool name. Yeah. And... I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Some, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to make a reference to the to the old cop show. <laughs> uh, cop show. Uh, chips. Oh well, these are Wait. these are chimps, like like primates. Yeah. So there was. 
I remember an ad, I remember seeing an ad when I was a kid that parodied the opening of Chips, but it was Chimps. Oh, uh, that that actually would be pretty good. What preceded Chips was the uh, a live action show called Lance Link, uh, uh, Secret Chimp, and they dressed up chimpanzees in actual clothes and carried out short uh, uh, spy dr uh, dramas with them. It's pretty pretty funny and broken. I don't think you could do that today. Oh. Probably, probably not. But given, I suppose, I suppose what makes it easier on, on this fr on this front is the fact that if the um, character sheet you guys sent me is any indication, you are not set. You are not doing it where you have where you have points in um sk in skills. You you may have points in attributes, but not skills. That is correct. Oh. The, the only thing you have in skills is you'll put a little check mark on a skill that you've decided to take formal training mm -hmm. in order to remove the, the cap of four. And then on uh, for things where you've actually specialized, you'll put a second check mark. And then magically you've got a, a floor of three, which doesn't make you succeed more, but it keeps you from fumbling. Mm -hmm. Now, with, e with each of the attributes... It's clear that they have a set of skills that they're associated with. Um, you've got some for covert, got some for fitness, and so on. And then there is Zen, and I've talked I've talked quite a bit in different about different games that have what I've colloquially called an extra effort system. Um, this is usually some limited some some limited resource pool that can, that can. Up, can apply certain benefits, whether it's allowing do-overs, allowing an edit button, what have you. Um, in World of Darkness, it is willpower. In Shadowrun, it's edge. In Eclipse Phase, it's mo it's moxie. Um, is Z and um, in Legend of the Five Rings, it was void. In is Zen some something similar to that, where it's more of a it's more of a metaphysical attribute. That's a good way of describing it. There are a lot of things you can do with, with Zen. You buy it as if it's a regular skill. It costs the same. But rather than doing any training in it, whatever you've paid for uh, is the number of points you start off with on your first mission. Um, in between missions, you'll recover one Zen point for free. But if you, in order to recover more, for the most part, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to uh, do the regular re uh, recreation and, and, and recuperation that humans do, but role-playing characters tend not to. So uh, it's, a, it's a mechanism where uh, if you want to recover a lot of Zen points quickly, if you want to use them up really quickly and then recover them, then you end up, being, you end up portraying a character who's kind of a, a hard-living um, hard person. And what I mean by that is, one of these high energy people who goes and defeats all the bad guys, but then has to spend two days, you know, in a bar sucking down thuds and playing pool and, and whatever. And that becomes a, a financial draw. So basically you have to, it, we, we could look at it as you're buying your Zen points back with money, which mitigates your ability to either buy cool, other cool equipment or pay off your debt or what have you. Um, it also better explains what you do on your off time. Uh, insofar as you've got to find activities that will uh, help you recover psychologically to put your recenter yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what you can do with Zen points, the main function of it is it's going to allow player characters and uh, hero villains, uh, which is to say villains for whom uh, if, if it was a movie that their name would appear with as an actual name in the credits, as opposed to third thug on the bus. Um, so, uh, you would spend Zen points in the in the case where you suffer an injury, but you don't want that injury to stop you. In this game, you don't count down hit points. We don't have any sort of the hit points with them. What we do is your character has resilience. For a, a typical human, your resilience is two. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone who does one trauma to you, one trauma is less than your resilience, so it just has no effect on you. And if in in effect, or in 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 uh, effect, a three-year-old has walked up and starts punching you in the knee, 
And that, that, that three-year-old can do that all day and it's never gonna hurt you because it's, it's one or less points of trauma and your resilience is two. Um, if you're wearing light armor, that'll add one to your, your resilience. If you're wearing medium armor, it'll add two. Uh, and uh, so when you're suffering injuries, essentially the level of, of injury that you suffer is the total trauma divided by um, your, your resilience. Uh, and uh, so in this case, if I suffer seven points, of, uh, seven points of trauma, I've got a resilience of two. It'll take two points to make me battered, which has no real effect. It'll take four points to actually give me an injury and eight points to gravely injure me and render me unconscious. And so the, the, the effect of that hit is just a one strike against you and you don't have to tally up numbers and things are generally not cumulative. It's not like you run out of hit points. So in the event that I took a lucky hit from, from, the, from a target, I've got Zen points, I burn off the appropriate number of Zen points, and technically I took a grave wound, but it doesn't affect me. And that's a situation where our heroes like John McClane or John Wick, you know, take some horrific, you know, gunshot to the, to the stomach or a stab to the, to the collarbone and keep fighting through it because they, they've got the Zen points to do it. Mm -hmm. and in that regard in that regard the way you're describing zen ends up reminding me of um the way fortune points can work in bo in um both warhammer fantasy and the ffg run of um warhammer 40k uh role play in role play in both parts not not battle obviously because you could um you could utilize fortune points to to cheat more de more debilitating um, circumstances. It's just that it it's just that you could either use a fortune point to give yourself to give yourself a little boost or burn it and um, t essentially ch essentially cheat something that would kill that would normally kill you. The catch, of course, is that um, when you're burning it, you're get you're um, taking it off the top of your maximum instead of your current amount. Correct. Uh, so the first thing I would say is, yes, we've stolen every good idea from every other game system. Um, <laughs> so the second second way I would look at this is uh, it's kind of a hybrid insofar as, you you know, the, the Zen isn't going to simply recover. It's something you're going to have to go actively uh, re re restore. But it's not karma. And uh, it's perfectly fine for people to use karma or, or Zen or dark side points, whatever that uh, from from Star Wars. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of different ways of describing how this particular thing works. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for from a personality standpoint is to have characters uh, like you know one of the, the one of the big differences between Conan and the kind of people that he fights is that he, Conan never surrenders. He doesn't give up. So his Zen number would probably be like nine. It's not that he takes more damage than you but he's got these end points to burn and he keeps fighting through the pain, you know, through, with the broken bone. And he, you know, he keeps, he keeps coming on at you. If you, mm -hmm. if you've got the, the, the experience to buy high enough Zen, then you're pretty tough to, to, to bring down. And, uh, but it's not a, not a factor of luck. You could say that mechanically it works the same and I would completely agree with you, but I would say from a personality standpoint, it's designed to make it feel different and again your mileage may yeah i'm on, i'm only doing that to draw parallels uh which is so something i do a lot when it comes to bringing my students in to various games because a big a big thing that i've been doing for the last nine years has been showcasing that the the various games that everybody says are extremely complicated are not as not as complicated and daunting as the, as people think. Um, now, with that, uh, well, what, what, one of the things I'd like to comment real quick on what you just said is, uh, I've I've taught a couple of classes on on game design and I've done a bunch of uh, of uh, uh, conferences, and one of the things that I try to describe to people is there's no such thing as a complicated system in terms of the system doing what the system does, what throws players for a loop, or for that matter, any sort of student, is, in my opinion, is not 
like how thick the rule book is, it's how many exceptions there are. That if I give you a rule on how the universe works, whether it's gravitation or you know air pressure or whatever, that rule might on a, on a chalkboard look relatively complicated, but it operates under strict rules and all you just plug in the numbers and you get an output, it's simple. Uh, the challenge is when the teacher says, so this is the rule you use for pushing a ball up a hill except on Tuesday or when it's raining or when you're wearing Nike shoes as opposed to Adidas. Like when you start putting in those exceptions, that's when, you know, the, I think uh, most people perceive complexity and, and it really impacts them. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your opinion about that? Um, exception based gameplay has been one of those words that's gotten thrown around in the game design space for as long as I've been in it. And, I can certain I can certainly I can certainly see it. Um, I'm mo I'm I mostly am a, am of the mindset that um, a lot of that um there's a lot of games that can appear that can appear complex, but the complexity is really on the on the um on a more front loaded affair where a lot a lot of it is more. The, a lot of the complexity is more in um, character creation than in actual um, role playing, and it's it's very easy to, it's very easy to get that muddled up when you're when you're just looking at it for the first time, and so so that's why I said that my goal has always been to try and demystify this sort of thing. But getting to getting to the matter at hand now, given the given the roles that you had that you had mentioned, um, I am curious if in the full book you you plan on putting any um, bits of advice for GMs on how some on how some of those roles can cross over, because based on the description you gave of, of the roles. It could be very easy for somebody to assume that campaign that campaigns would focus on one role above all others. Well, let me try this. I think that if you decide to have a campaign that was based heavily on Robotech, you'd have a lot of soldiers, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a campaign that was a bit more open-ended, I'm going to say something like the original Mission Impossible show that our our uh, Mr. Phelps would start every show with a eight by ten, or not eight by ten, but a, a, a vanilla envelope filled with eight by tens of photographs of his entire team, and he'd choose. He needs this lady and this guy and this lady and this guy to be in the mission today, and that this guy and this lady stand, you know, are are sitting out. And that probably had more to do with uh, which of the which of the uh, actors was available that week for the show. But nonetheless, that you have a team and that, you know, the, the team is going to shuffle folks around. Uh, in this case, I think what I'm thinking is uh, uh, that the referee is going to provide, uh, you know, here's a mission uh, that, that I'm going to assign to this corporate agent. And he's going to draft um, the characters to help him out. And some of those characters will be more useful than others. And even how each character might be utilized is going to be a little bit up in the air because the referee knows what the mission is and knows what's going to unfold. The player characters don't. And so you bring everybody and then, oh, we didn't think we need a computer hacker. Fortunately, we've got one. Oh, we didn't think we needed a, a guy that can uh, go interface with uh, uh, you know, this group outside the wall. But we've got that guy. And... So it, it creates a situation where if each of the players wants to go in a very different direction with their character design, there's still plenty of opportunity for them to participate in most any mission um, with you know, some exceptions. If the referee's really bound and determined to be very linear in terms of what he provides as a mission, then, then that's that. But in addition to regular missions, there's also a gig board. And what that means is that the player characters are in positions to choose additional missions to go on, uh, perhaps even sacrificing assignments 
uh, in order to find something they think is more lucrative or something they've got a better chance of uh, at, at, to succeed, that, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, the roles, if we try to compare these, the roles in this game with the character classes from D&D, uh, in 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 D and D, if you're a thief, you get this lock picking percentage, and you get this climbing walls percentage, and whatnot. And we don't have any of that. The only real thing that differentiates you between one role and another is who's your boss, how much money did you start with, what kind of gear did you start with, how much debt did you start with, and after that, you can kind of do what you want to do, as long as you're paying off your debt. Shrug. You know, it's it's up to you to kind of make your own path, and it's kind of up to you to decide what you're going to uh, uh, spend your your experience points to buy in terms of fields and skills and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, with now going for going further into that, uh, when you when you mentioned Mission Impossible, the f one of the first things that came to mind was the ensemble play that a game like say Ars Magica is kind of built around where there's the assumption that people are going to have multiple characters is is that something that could theoretically be possible with Zone 17 with the, how you've got it planned? We definitely provide that and encourage players to, to play that um, that uh, doesn't appear in the character book though that appears in the referee's book, the controller book book 3 and uh uh, so that's definitely something that we find uh, as a very interesting thing. That said, we don't really play it. Um, you know, we'll we'll give somebody two or three characters at the vehicle level to move things around, so we can make sure that the arithmetic is correct for the range on a weapon or whatever, how much damage it does, that that kind of thing. But uh, at, you know, when we play the game from role playing, at least when I'm running the game, I. If someone wants to run two characters, they can, but no one's chosen to do it. So, yeah, I'd I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see actual real human beings uh, uh, try that out and let me know if that makes them happy. Yeah, that's why I brought up Ars Magica because that's that's kind of built around that fact. It's why it refers to its style as a passion play. Oh, what well, you know what? There is a way to answer your question where on the thing that we've tried. What we haven't done is have one person sit at the table with two character sheets, except to test some particular math thing during playtesting. What we have done is that one person might own two, three, or even four character sheets, and they choose which one they want to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And so that's a thing that I think is a better answer to your question. Yeah. Now, one of the other things I did notice on the, she on the sheet was the um was the was the entries for multiple what looks like multiple types of applications for gong fu is are you guys planning on doing a sort of fighting style system yes and no um the easy answer is yes and it's mostly true but here's how it works uh there is one system uh you can strike an opponent we don't care how you struck them you can grab the opponent. We don't care how you grabbed him. But those are the two uh, types of attacks. Both of them can do damage. The grab is more difficult to do damage with. You have to grab someone before you can then, you know, successfully, before you can do a second successful grab to actually apply like a submission hold or to pick them up and throw them over a railing or something like that. Um, the strike just does straight damage. It's the same thing as any, any conventional melee attack. However... There are multiple styles. So every style is Gong Fu because the translation of Gong Fu is something equivalent to like force and effort. Mm. Okay. Um, but if you want to study Wushu, Wushu will take you and give you like you, you, you'll, you'll find us uh, when you run on a, on a mission if, on our future mission books and whatnot, you will find, Oh, look, I'm in Chicago and I've come across a trainer in boxing. Oh, okay. Well, what will that do for me? Well, if you if you spend the time, you can study under that um, uh, uh, sensei, and you will learn how to slip punches. And what that would mean is, uh, you have you would probably get uh, a modifier or a floor 
on any dice applied to dodging enemy strikes. Because boxing isn't mostly about punching. It's actually about slipping, slipping punches. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would go through that with dozens of martial arts. And mm -hmm. if you study with a different boxing coach, he'll probably be able to teach you a different thing, maybe something about footwork. Um, so where this would come into play is too many games uh, are uh, have melee combat that's like the opening to the Itchy and Scratchy show on Simpsons, where the mouse and the cat stand next to each other with bats and they don't move. They just, I hit you with the bat, then you hit me, then I hit you, then you hit me. That's, you know, frankly, an awful lot of the D20 systems. And I love them, I play them, but it's not, it's not the game I want to put my name on. So what we do here is if you were to study under the boxing coach that teaches you about footwork, you'd be able to floor your punch or add an extra trauma or something if you actually slip to the side first. And so your character would move one or two inches in a direction defined by a little table that would show up in the, in, you know, the rules for that particular art. Um, in, the, in the basic character book, we don't have any extra martial arts. But in subsequent books, we're going to have all kinds of them. And we'll probably give out a, a couple free on the website for people to incorporate into their games. The, uh, our website is slowly accumulating material. Um, we're going to be giving away free floor plans that you can use in this and other role-playing games. Uh, for example, like a, a floor of an office building. So if, if you want to be on the 10th floor of Nak uh, Nakatoma Plaza, you'll have an office building that you could use for that purpose, if, that's, if that holds you interest. There'll be a nightclub. There'll be, you know, all sorts of things. Um, a, a, a fine dining restaurant, so you've got a kitchen to run through. I don't know why so many action movies have to take place running through a kitchen, but they seem to. Um, but in any event, we'll, we'll be providing a lot of that uh, sort of thing for free, and no doubt over the course of the next X number of months, there will be a couple of martial arts that show up in there that will give you the extra rules you need to specialize in this thing or that thing. And as far as as far as the kitchen question, well, why why does John Woo keep using pigeons in his work? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, I don't know. And why does why does Chow Young Fat always carry a couple of extra guns rather than a couple of extra magazines? It's just what they do. It's whenever. This the, I, a bit of a policy that I've had, and this is something of a mantra: is believability over realism. Because a lot of people, when that when it comes to discussions of realism in um in ga in games and in game and in game design, um, end up forgetting that the that the people who would who would want that le that level of realism are the one percent of the one percent of the one percent whereas if you if you have if you have something that's ridiculous but have people but present it in a way that people can go along with it they they will um i like the tagline that was used in the first superman movie you will believe that a man can fly because the audience wants to be tricked <laughs> Um, I, I agree with that hundred percent, which I think goes, and it, maybe I'm wrong here, but I would think that that also goes into why, uh, a substantial amount of audiences seem to object so much to retcons in that you made me believe your thing by setting up a, a set of common rules and then you broke the rules and that sort of thing tends to drive some people crazy. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just hearkening back to my, um, psychological objection to all things exceptions but <laughs> yeah and person personally the the approach i've taken with it is that when there are ways that you can do a retcon that aren't going that aren't going to piss off the audience the best way to do it is that is is that um what people saw what people saw wasn't the whole story um, you know the you know the it's the right and the wrong way to do a twist. The the if somebody if I was to use a master class as far as the wrong way, I'm, I'd probably bring up the usual suspects. Um, but the 
but th but the I'd say I'd say the big issue whenever it comes to whenever it comes to retcons is when it's when it's clear when it's clearly somebody talking out of their ass and acting like they're not <laughs> uh, or or the the in the new information in the retcon ends up stretching credibility with what was br with what was brought up i remember an infamous case for me was um was man of was man of steel where they make a big deal about how kryptonians can't handle the the um the intense effects of yellow sun yellow sunlight without without spent without spending a bit of time getting used to it it took it took Clark quite a while to get used to it himself, and that's that plays into some of the fights in that in taking that filter off, and they just can't handle the, the enhanced senses. And then Zod just takes his armor off and and says that he mastered his senses by train by training, and that's a and it's a case of you just you just broke your own rules just for the sake of drama, and you Correct. just killed you. It's more. It's more of people. If you're get, when you do that kind of thing, um, what you're telling the audience is that the time they spent investing in the in the story um, was a waste. And if you're wasting the audience's time, then there's a question of why the hell am I watching you? <laughs> and but that that's my, that's my own little. Ta my own little tangent when it comes to believability and realism and the whole retcon thing. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. In, in our case, uh, the thing is, as an engineer, I know what the formulas are for how fast you'll fall and whatnot. And I could include that kind of thing in the game. I could get you an abstraction for reaching terminal velocity at, with different, you know, aspects of. Of uh, you know whether you're falling head first or or flat faced or whatever, um, but that's not interesting. What I'm interested in is providing you an experience that looks and feels cinematic, and I try to get the tempo of the game to align with the the movies and the TV shows and whatnot that I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, and if that means to an extent that realism be damned, shrug. Oh well. Um, it doesn't mean that when I'm watching uh, uh, the Avengers uh, film where Tony Stark gets thrown out a window, I get out a stopwatch and I, you know, I'm trying to calculate. All right, so he's falling fleet. You know, he's going to reach terminal velocity here. He's going to be moving 120 miles an hour. But I'm not going to give that to players. That's my personal problem. And I will, I will admit that. Oh. The, I have I have a similar thing whenever it comes to whenever it comes to certain firearms I will be that guy who com who complains about how e how every movie completely mi completely um misunderstands suppressors Oh yeah like it's it's always portrayed as a poof poof or in real life yeah no you're it's not that quiet by a long shot Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's some tiny calibers you can make that qu you can make that quiet, but the thing is, those are tiny calibers. That'd be the that'd be the firearm equivalent to a blowgun. <laughs> so if you have a 22 long rifle and you've got a two liter drink uh, drink bottle, anyway. Mm -hmm. But the, but even even then, I'm not I'm. At this at this point, I've I've settled on it's it's being done because that's how everybody th that's how everybody over there thinks it's it's supposed to be done more than anything else. And if you if you were if you were to do a more realistic approach, then you'd throw you'd throw off the audience. And my demonstration of that thinking is some somebody somebody once in the development of the game Bulletstorm had. Had asked why? Why do we need to have the exploding barrels be red? Why? Why can't they just be a, a normal colored barrel? So they tried that in play testing, but nobody shot the barrels that when that was when they did that. I think at one point they tried to make the barrels green just to see what would happen, and nobody shot them. 
Um, <laughs> so you have to you have to embrace the tropes at sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the coconut effect. Like you know, everybody knows that horse set uh, horse hooves uh, sound like two coconuts being slapped together because that's the stock sound effect. Mm -hmm. e even though you know it do they don't. You lie. I've seen Monty Python's Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying coconuts migrate? For another example, uh, whenever uh, in a historical drama about Rome, uh, all the statues being portrayed as white marble, when you know in reality they were pretty garishly colored. Mm -hmm. Like ev like everything else in Rome was garishly colored. Yeah. <laughs> now, with the. I do want, to, with that in with that in mind. Um, now, as I as I understand it, you you guys are going to be doing um, three books: a character's guide, a vehicle's guide, and a controller guide. It's the vehicles end. I, I do want to go into because earlier you mentioned testing whether or not you could do just a simple race and and make it work. Um, one of the big things that's in a lot of action movies is, of course, vehicle chases. And there's a lot of factors that's done with it. It's almost a tradition in Mad Max to have one, one big, one big uh, multi-vehicle slugfest, for lack of a better word. Um, how do you, how would, you, how do you guys manage um, those, those sort of chase, those sort of chases, while still, while still making it engaging? In at battle scale, um, I'm still refining uh, a function that I'm calling traction. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we can have a couple of race cars. By race cars, I just mean like a couple of big, you know, US V8s from like the 1960s, running around a racetrack, drifting a bit, you know, as, the, as they do corners. Mm -hmm. That function works great. Uh, I don't know exactly what would happen if you tried that same thing with a tracked vehicle. You know, like, how much do I have to care that it's going to slip a track? Or do I just not care and let you let you uh, uh, drift a tank? We have seen at least one example of that in one of the uh, Pierce Brosnan 007 tanks he, uh, movies. He's driving a tank around Moscow or something like that. And yeah, I believe that was GoldenEye. Well, uh, sure. And, and uh, the thing is, uh, you know, what what is the reality there? And and frankly, I don't know. Uh, the um, uh, so some of these things, I think, when you've got a vehicle that's got tracks or feet or whatever, uh, the drifting is probably going to need to be muted. That's going to turn into an issue of traction, which I'm going to need to figure out what I want to do with you know how big the feet are and how much the vehicle weighs. And I'll do all of that behind the scenes so I can come up with one rule that works for all the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And this thing doesn't tr drift very much. That one does. Um, uh, so in at battle scale, everything moves relative to buildings because you're normally in a city or you're, or you're near a crater or the entrance to some subterranean enemy base. Whatever the deal is, when you're maneuvering the big vehicles at battle scale, there are fixed pieces of architecture that are the most important thing that you've got to maneuver around because you're there for a reason you're battling over a thing you're not you're not normally just fighting out in the middle of the desert but at agent scale once you get on vehicles it's too easy for a vehicle to move too fast to be on a board i've got a table downstairs that's eight feet long four feet wide it's as big or bigger than anyone else's gaming table with you know virtually no exceptions um so not only is it not big enough for the entire map from Campaign for North Africa, at least I think so, but it's also, it's not big enough for people to be, you know, for, for a Vin Diesel to be driving in a race car around the thing. So what I've decided to do is you have one key vehicle and everything orbits it. So the key vehicle, let's say that we've got a bunch of bad guys uh, chasing uh, John Wick and he's on a motorcycle and everyone else is on a motorcycle. Wick is going to decide how fast he's going to go. He's going to allocate the dice he needs to allocate to go that fast. 
everyone else is going to need to come up with that number. And if they come up with a higher number, they can choose to stay stationed with them or move forward based on how much higher they roll. If they don't roll that high, then they're not keeping pace and they're going to slide behind. And then the maneuvers are going to be a little bit of wiggling around the key vehicle. So uh, that's our current plan for car chases at agent scale. But again, that's going to be vehicles no bigger than like, I don't know, a, a garbage truck. Yeah. The moment you move into tanks and stuff, you slide the agent scale off and get the battle scale out. Mm -hmm. oh. And sen since you mentioned a central vehicle, I'm curious if that's something that could be re that could be reversed instead of the players um, being being around one central vehicle. There, you have the players trying to attack one one central vehicle instead. Well, that's exactly how it would play. Like all the ninja, with you know, are coming up to John Wick and trying to whack him over the head with their swords, uh, or or shoot at him shoot at him with handguns, and he's coping with them one at a time with high speed and, and, and adjacent or occasional violent maneuvers. Mm -hmm. That's, that certainly makes sense. Um, and I, now with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as the page count for all three books? The original books that, that enamored me back in role-playing days uh, were those of Traveler. Traveler books are five and a half by eight and a half. So they're essentially a letter sized sheet of paper folded in half. And those books are about 40 to 48 pages. We're shooting for 80 to 84. So each of our book is, is uh, literally twice the size. And uh, um, if you hold on just a second, I've got a thing for you. This is a draft of the cover, Zone 17 cover. Um, this is the draft of the cover that we're working on right now. Ultimately, uh, the, the final cover cover may be a little different, but um, and I've got one for the controller book too, but I don't see it offhand. I'll have to I'll have to dig that up. I'll send it to you when we're done with the phone call. But mm -hmm. um, in any event, uh, uh, so you would get approximately two hundred and forty pages, maybe two hundred and fifty four pages. Uh, of content, and it's almost all text. We don't waste any of your dollars buying pages that are loaded up with so many graphics that there's not that much content on a page. Um, the books in this format are more portable, that if you're wearing cargo pants, they probably fit in your pocket. Uh, if you download one of the PDF versions, because we will be selling this electronically, not only is it a lot cheaper, the, the, the main book, the MSRP, I think is $14.95. The PDF versions are probably more like four dollars and ninety-five cents. Um, I'd have to check the our, our Kickstarter to to verify the the pricing that we we've agreed on, but it's going to be something like that. So if you want to save money, you can just download uh, the the book electronically, and then it's perfectly fine to sit on your uh, tablet because you don't have to shrink it down or pan around on a page because your tablet's about the size of the book. So we we went out of our way to try to make things more. Uh, accessible to folks. Um, at least one potential purchaser has reached out and asked if we could um, make a special PDF with really large type. And I asked him what his requirements were, but basically we're willing to do that. We could build a, a special book for people who maybe have uh, uh, less vision than I, which you know is, is already pretty bad. So uh, we can certainly hook people up if, if possible. Mm -hmm. But... <sighs> With that in with that with that in mind, I will certainly be keeping a close eye on things, and and especially how this particular project will develop. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Uh, well, thank you for having us. If I knew I was supposed to bring more madness, I could have had like some LSD or at least a couple more. No, uh, no, 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 none of that. I've learned okay, my lesson from last fine. time. You want all, you want sincerity, not looniness. I got it. Yeah. Um, the the last the last thing that I want is some is somebody cosplaying Archimedes. If you catch my drift. 
I do. Uh, but any anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you for hosting us. It was a lot of fun. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>